Hello, hmm. I'm Anika Vislish. I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sharon, at the Africa Science Buskers Festival 2021. Dr. Sharon Adipo Dorku is a Ghanaian American wife, mom, and author of a children's book. Dr. Adipo Dorku is also an independent consultant and co principal of Tertia LLC where she has overseen the executive management of the organization and provided technical support to clients using analytics, critical research, and culturally responsive evaluation. She graduated from the University of Texas Health Science Center at the Houston School of Public Health. Dr. Adipo Dorku has presented at several conferences, led international research, and evaluation projects and co-facilitated virtual training. She has interests and experiences in leadership, framework development, surveys, health policy, and evaluation. Her goal is to encourage reading and early childhood education as she truly sees the implications in positive outcomes in adulthood. We are extremely thrilled to have you today at the Africa Science Buskers Festival 2021. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Sharon. Over to you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and thank you everybody for being here today. Quite an honor to be speaking to all of you who are from my, my home, my continent, and I'm glad to be speaking to you today on a career path in STEM and service to community. So before I start, I figured I'll share something with you. And the reason for sharing this is because I want you to think about STEM as really age agnostic. And I'll tell you a bit of what that means in a minute. So I'm gonna hopefully this plays. Um, I hope you do. Hello. Sorry about that. <laughs> we can see your screen, Dr. Sharon. Wonderful. All right. I hope that you were all able to see the video. Um, I will stop that for now and go back to my slides. And the reason why I wanted to open with that is because that is actually my daughter who just did that. It's an animation project that she did during one of her summer camps. And I wanted to share that because what you're seeing in her path and her dreams in STEM is no different from how I started and where I am now. And you see that very clearly throughout my journey as I talk about it. So as um, Anika mentioned, I am Ghanaian American. So it's very important to me to share this space with you, especially with fellow Africans, right? Um, so I'll start by my talk today by going over my identity. I'll go into a little bit about my journey and talk about a, a project that I did on mobile um, health clinics. So I am a Ghanaian American. I'm a female scientist, a wife, a public health professional, I'm a health services and policy researcher, I'm a mom, I'm a Jesus follower, an evaluator, author, engineer. And why is all of this important? It's important for me to ground all of you in who I am and how that influenced my journey. So what does that mean? So typically when you start off um, as you're coming up, I showed you what my daughter did um, throughout her, her camp process and what projects she developed. And then you think about, okay, what does the future look like for me? Is it gonna be a nice straight, you know, nice straight path like you see here on the slide, straight to success? Um, and then I have a question mark. That question is really, is it that linear? You learn from my experiences anyway, and many other folks that I've spoken to in this field that it's really not. It, it, sometimes it has different curves, sometimes you take turns, and then you develop and find interests and passions as you go along the way. 
Okay, so here is how my journey started. So as you can see on the left side, where I, when I went to school, I got my bachelor's actually in biomedical science, in biomedical engineering rather, and a minor in chemical engineering. And after that, I was I knew I wanted to be in the health space, and I was looking for something to do in terms of work. So I ended up going to work for a clinic in uh, one of the states here in the U.S. as a medical assistant. And through all those processes, all those times, I was still learning a bit more about myself and my interests. So I went back to school after that time, and over to the right here, got my Master of Science. And with that, I focus on biomedical science and biotechnology because, again, the health space was my interest. So then I moved on to work um, for a company that made medical equipment as an application specialist. All that means is that I traveled around several health institutions in the U.S. and really helped them set up the equipment, train them. And if they had any issues, they'll call on me. Um, in the bottom left here, Right around that time, again, I've told you different elements of my identity. Part of that time was also when things were happening in my life in terms of becoming a mom. So there were questions around what then do I see in my future? Again, back to that linear path or not, clearly you're beginning to see that it was not linear. There were things that were happening in my life that had informed some of the changes and the decisions and the passions that I was beginning to really um, evolve into. So then I, like I said, after working with this company for a while, had my first baby. And during that time, very, became very clear what I saw as my ultimate goal when I retire. So in that sense, again, as a Ghanaian American, I wanted to go back home to Ghana, retire there, work in the Ministry of Health in some capacity. So public health and, and specifically, specifically policy in the health space was what I was interested in. So I went um, back to school, got my master's in public health. And this is what has informed some of the work that I ended up doing and getting my PhD in health policy. And now as you can see, I'm able to deal in these two spaces of being a consultant and a health services researcher. But the key point of all of this is to let you know that all throughout, there's a sense of community that grounded me. So community as could be my personal community, community as in when I was going through school, who, the mentors and other people that I was relating to, and community in terms of the purpose, right, for what I wanted to do. I wanted to be of service with all my knowledge, both uh, in, in science and public health and all the other skill sets, be of service to community. So I wanted um, that to be the entire focus of how I ended up using my skills in STEM. So I wanted to end this journey aspect of my talk with this picture. I started by sharing with you something that my daughter did. So that's my daughter in, this, in the picture that you're seeing. And then you're seeing me with my kids, with um, another individual who is actually one of the phenomenal, phenomenal public health experts in the US, the UCLA public school, um, School of Fielded is named after him. Um, and I wanted to share this because I wanted you to focus on what I started with, which is to tell you the story about STEM being a diagnostic, having those dreams that you have right now, and how that propels you on a path, not necessarily always linear, as you can see from my example, but you still get to use all those skills to define who you are, again, in all the completeness of what your identity is. So now I'm going to switch gears to speaking about a project that I did as part of my education work in mobile. Health. Sharon? Yeah. It looks like, so I can actually see your PowerPoint screen, but it looks like the slides you're sharing may not be sharing with me at the moment. I'm just seeing a screen of your title slide. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's you can, okay. You can, presume it. You, can just, you can just reshare with the full screen slides if you're doing that. Sounds good. I'll stop sharing and do that. Thank you for letting me know. I hope folks didn't miss too much. We learned a lot from what you were saying, though. So I yeah. hope that sticks within <laughs> all of your heads as you are as Sharon is trying to reshare her screen again. Yeah, um, and it's a good time to see my screen because I'm going to go into more specific details about my work. How is it now? Can you see mobile clinics? No, it seems like I cannot. Okay. Hold on. Um, I wonder. Maybe I'll just share my whole screen and that might help the issue. 
Uh, okay. What do you see now? Do you see slide? So I see mobile clinics. Wonderful. They're yeah. So if you just want to like keep going through the arrow keys, that's super awesome. Awesome. So we're yeah. We're all I'm able to see it full screen. That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> please, please continue. <laughs> Thank you that so much for oh, really saying awesome. everything before. That was yeah. really helpful, by the way. I hope it really stuck in everyone's head what yeah. Sharon's background was and her aspirations. And now we're going to talk about mobile clinics yeah. from Dr. Sharon. Wonderful. Okay. So my dissertation work, which is the work that I did to complete my PhD, was in mobile clinics. So the question is, what are they? They are customized vehicles with medical equipment and they're staffed to provide health services. What does that mean? So we all eventually end up going to see a provider, a clinician or a doctor um, at some point in our lives for several reasons. And you go to a certain building with all this equipment, with all this, uh, all these staff that cater to your needs. Now imagine that same service or those equipment and individuals are on a moving vehicle. So this is actually what a mobile health care clinic is. And currently in the US specifically, there are about 2000 of them that serve about 7 million people annually. And really they're community based in that they're able to go into the communities and provide care to populations. And then finally, because they're able to go into communities and help um, around conditions that, such as disease prevention, they're able to, again, increase that access to care that folks in communities who might not be able to either geographically be able to access the clinic or for other reasons do not have access to those stationary um, clinics or healthcare facilities that I talked about. And they do all of this at reduced costs. So I wanted to show a visual of this. So this is one of the clinics over in uh, Texas. And it's it's actually part of the, the work that I did in terms of collecting survey data from the organization. This, this is a Texas Children's Medical Hospitals Clinic. So a little bit more about the economics of mobile clinics. So when you invest every dollar in a mobile health care clinic, in, again, in the U.S. context, there's $36 that can be saved. So rather than having people go to the emergency rooms, they can go to the medical, um, the mobile clinic and invest in that dollar into building that mobile clinic. You're saving $36 for them, uh, for the patients going to the emergency room instead. However, as you can imagine, putting all that, the, putting the van and all that equipment on that van can um, really involve, when it comes to capital and operating costs, can be very significant. So therefore, there are a lot of multiple stakeholders that, that tend to be part of the process. So the question then is, why am I interested? Why did I bother doing this for my dissertation work? Well, when I was looking at the literature, there was a lot of informational evidence on using the clinics and looking at outcomes. So for example, when you look at um, a certain context in any part of the world, you can see that the outcomes, the health outcomes, so if it's a, a, a disease or a condition, you can see that the patients, their outcomes were improving by the use of the mobile clinic. However, as a, somebody who was interested in policy and thinking more systematically, if we wanted to use mobile clinics in our healthcare setting, how can we ensure that we have the necessary evidence to inform those policies? So then I, that's really one of the reasons why I chose to study them. So provide that evidence so they can be adopted widely. And secondly, thinking about how to actually define metrics. So when you're having all these different clinics go to different geographic areas, how do you know that this clinic here in this context X is doing well versus context Y? And being able to define metrics to help us researchers and those who actually practice this in life, so practitioners, be able to use this metrics to inform their decisions is very critical. And then finally, again, as I mentioned earlier, mobile clinics go into the communities, 
Usually these are rural areas. These are individuals or communities that are what we call at risk populations. So they might have um, certain chronic conditions that need to be catered to more frequently. So being able to have measures that helps a healthcare system prioritize that, okay, we do need to focus on this area more because of these reasons or because of the needs of these communities. That is a very important measure or tool to have. So these are, again, the reasons why they should be studied and why I studied them. So this is a map of the US. You see several um, states highlighted. Currently in the US, um, just to give you a bit more context since there's a global community here, there is in terms of paying for your medical expenses through insurance, there is something called Medicaid. And Medicaid is really at the state levels where people's care or expenses from care that they receive at a doctor's office or any other office is covered through that insurance. Um, in order for that to happen, though, states have to make sure the rules of expanding. So this is actually through another um, health care law in the U.S. You probably some of you might have heard of it. It's called the Obamacare or the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. It ensured that states could be able to expand this um, mo model or mode of providing insurance through Medicaid, right? However, not all the states decided to do that. So here you're just seeing states highlighted in dark blue that have not uh, adopted or decided to expand that Medicaid and the light blue ones have. And this is data as of February of this year. So why is this important? Well, in terms of me deciding how to choose which areas of the country to focus on, because honestly, I couldn't do the whole country, um, I had to think strategically. And as scientists, you should all know that sometimes you have to think about how you make decisions about your, how or what informs the decisions you make about your projects. So similar thing here. So I needed to decide which states should I focus on and why? So I focus on the states that had not expanded Medicaid. Um, obviously, there's a lot of them. And then the other criteria I use is to look at how many people had health care coverage in these states. When you look at across four states, Texas, Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina, there were about 3 million adults in total that did not have health care coverage. So that informed why I focused on these four states. Okay. So I developed a survey using SurveyMonkey and I looked at, so there's a mobile healthcare association in the US. So had the survey out to all the different programs, again, specifically in, in those four states. I will say I had to pilot the survey for the first time with a whole number of programs. So not necessarily all in my four states. And then after the survey, about 49 clinics were in my my sample that I collected um, over um, a period of uh, November 2016 to July 2017. And this is just to let you know about the response rates, which is how, what is the percentage of people that actually responded to my survey and that number was 18%. There are obviously limitations to this work. Um, if you think about um, collecting this um, sample within the Mobile Healthcare Association, so it's a sample of convenience. So there is selection bias to consider. When you look at my four states, Georgia was one of them, and they were able to provide me with a, a large number of clinics. And looking at the fact that clinics were my unit of analysis, it was important to categorize what these different clinics were doing. And Georgia had only one organization that provided 18 dental clinics for my sample. There's also recall bias because it's a survey. And when you look at the grand scheme of things, 49 clinics is not that big. So it's a small sample size. So there are other elements of the work that I did. I looked at the cost analysis. I looked at creating um, what, what you call an index where geographically you can measure how well some um, the, the mobile clinics were doing in some areas versus others and a number of other publications. However, for today, in, in the interest of time, I'm quickly going to share with you the cost analysis results. So the costs were analyzed from what we call a provider perspective. So it's more of what the mobile clinic reported. So nothing about what the patient actually reported in terms of costs. Direct costs um, were accounted for. So the direct costs were things around the maintenance and the salaries of the staff in the mobile clinic. 
And then there's the capital cost, which is the cost of actually buying the mobile van and all the equipment that went into it. And then finally, if you do economics, this is something that you should be familiar with. That is when you have any type of costs or you do any type of, type of economic analysis, you want to be mindful of inflation that is happening in the market. So in my case, I had to adjust to the 2018 US dollars. So quick summary that when I did my analysis, it became very clear that mobile clinics do provide the access again in these four states, and they do this at a low cost. The, when you look at the median and median on average, again, because of the fact that you have cost data, which can be very skewed, which means you can have some in very low um, ranges and some in very high ranges. When you look at the median cost for the mobile healthcare clinics, specifically looking at those that provided preventive services, that amount was $243. When you look at something that could be similar in terms of the healthcare settings, there's something called FQHCs. These are known as federally qualified health centers. And these are, again, those stationary, you know, the, the brick and mortar offices that you can actually go into. However, these are funded by um, the federal government and able to provide care to individuals um, that are, the, the term is the, the fall, they're in the, what they call a safety net gap. And really what that means is when it comes to access and ensuring everybody has the access to healthcare that they need, it's not equal across the board. So making sure that there are social, um, social structures that are available to cater to all of the needs of the population is very critical. So part of that is how, why we have the federally qualified health centers in the US. However, when you compare having a mobile health care clinic, as I said, costing $243 to what it will cost to go to FQHC, that number is 573. So it goes to show you that mobile clinics do provide their services at a low cost and they can be tapped into to as resources for communities. And then finally, when it came to the dental programs in my sample, they have the, the highest number of healthcare services, which is not surprising because I mentioned that one state gave me a whole number of clinics that were all dental. So in wrapping up here in the interest of time, if you forget anything at all about mobile clinics today, just remember that mobile clinics, um, this is a quote by Sisler, mobile clinics work in some places, not all places, where the economics makes sense and where the technology can survive the bumpy roads because you're taking the care on the road and you need to make sure that you're able to afford the, both the infrastructure and the maintenance of the equipment, of the salaries of the staff, as well as the mobile um, van itself. So I am sharing these references. I'm happy to, um, I look forward to any questions that might be in the chat and happy to follow up with anybody that is interested in this topic some more. Um, so in summary, I spoke to you today about who I am, and I'm excited to have spoken with a number of you on my home continent. I've shared with you my journey and how you should consider the fact that there's not always a linear path to your success in STEM. However, you take those opportunities and you grow out of it, you find your path and you evolve in a mixture of what is happening to you in your personal life and what you're trying to do in your career. And then I hope I was able to do justice to share my passion project on mobile clinics. Um, thank you to Annika and the team. Um, thank you to African Science Vasquez. I always like to be appreciative of my family and my personal community, as well as all my mentors. And here's my contact page. Um, it might flash too quickly, so if you need to do a, a screenshot, you can go right ahead. And I'll open it up for questions now. Thank you so much. Um. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sharon, um, for presenting today. Um, unfortunately, just due to time concerns, we may not have the time for questions today. But please send your e please send an email or a message to African Science Buskers. We will collect your questions and send them over to Sharon um, so that she can answer them for you. And once again, we'd like to thank Dr. Sharon for coming and giving such an inspirational presentation. 
uh, such an inspiring presentation um, to everyone. And um, we'd like to thank you for attending the session of African Science um, Buskers Festival 2021. And we hope everyone has a great day and has learned a lot through all the presentations today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We have one more presentation today. Um, so please stick around for that one. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending all the past sessions. Have a great day, everyone.